I'm interested in conversations that deal with things that matter, that real, you know, how do we live our lives? First of all, make climate change personal in your life. The second step is get angry and get active. And the third step, and believe it or not, I think this is the most important. We have to imagine this world that we want to hurry towards. But kindness is looking at people as people and not as I voted this, I do this, whatever it is. There are some people we will never get along with, but most of us, most of us are a complex mass of different things. I hope you enjoy your events in this year's digital programme and that they spark in you thoughts and conversations and feelings. All the things that a good book should do and all the things that a wonderful book festival like Edinburgh International Book Festival does too. It's a book festival that's really dear to my heart. It's one of the first festivals I attended as a new author. I was part of the Outriders Africa programme and every year returning to it feels a little bit like coming back to a literary home. It's such a pleasure to see them going online this year, and I'm so excited for the future of Edinburgh International Book Festival. Hi everyone, welcome to the Edinburgh International Book Festival. Uh, and that you're watching this at home more than likely means that you're aware of the changes in format. Uh, a lot of that due to this, the, the crazy times that we're living in right now. Uh, but we're still here and we're still bringing you events and writers who are writing the most important works uh, for us today. And this is largely through the support of sponsors. This event today with Roger Robinson has been sponsored by the British Council. So I am Kai Miller and we'll be listening to and then having a chat with Roger Robinson today. Roger was born and grew up on the twin island Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, but has been part of the British literary landscape for a while, not just a voice in its own right, um, but a kind of presence that has made space um, for other talent uh, to grow and to be and to be nurtured. I'm thinking of your work with Malika's Kitchen, for instance, Roger. Uh, so there has always been in his work uh, what I think is a grounding in community, a reaching out to that community, and a giving voice to that community but with his recent and very much deserved win of the T.S. Eliot Prize for 2019, I think several more people are coming to the awareness that though this has always been important to Roger's work, this grounding in community, that what we also have to consider is the very individual um, literary achievement of his own work. Um, and so we want to think about that as well. Think about Raja as part of a community, but think about his individual talent and achievement. Uh, Raymond Antrobus, I think, very rightly calls Raja one of the most important voices in the UK right now. Uh, so our format today will be, we're going to hand over to Raja and Raja will be reading um, for five or 10 minutes and tying into that reading a kind of conversation um, about his own work. And then we will 
uh, join him again, and we and I will ask some questions of Raja. So over to you, Raja, and thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Kai. Um, yeah. Listen, I'm super happy to be here at Edinburgh Book Festival, International Book Festival. Uh, I, I have so much respect for Kai as a writer, and, and I'm so happy to be here with him and to be reading and talking to everyone. Uh, I looked online and I saw people were saying what they wanted from the reading and the talk. And one teacher said, I need information to teach my sixth formers your work. <laughs> And I was like, well, that's an interesting idea. Um, so let me tell you what I'm going to try and do. Uh, what I'm trying to do is unpack specific touchstones for the book to give you kind of like the cheat goals with the hope that it will get you thinking about your practice if you're a writer or to expand your appreciation of the poems if you're a reader. So as we proceed, I'm going to tell you the point I'm trying to emphasize about the book and read a cluster of poems from A Portable Paradise and then illustrate it. And then I'll talk a little bit about what informed and influenced the ideas and repeat that for four sections if we could get through it. Um, I'm not sure we will in terms of time, but I'll try my best. I've also thrown in some questions. I use questions as a form of artistic thought and interrogation. And, um, and I also included notes to myself, like I look back to all the, the notes of A Portable Paradise. And also in my notes, I would often write down like informative quotes. That, that I gleaned along the way that will kind of keep me or steer me in different directions. Um, so that says, let's begin. The first thing I want to talk about uh, in terms of the influence of Portable Paradise is, is music. So I'm going to read three poems. Um, I just keep music in mind. And, and these poems are pretty short. The Job of Paradise. It is a job of paradise to comfort those who've been left behind, to think that all those loved and lost would live on there like tiny gods. It is a job of mumble prayers to help you calm your hurts and fears. It is a job of the long black hearse to show we head to death from birth. It is the job of the clean, neat grave to remind us how to live our days. If only I could live my days till death suffice and make earth feel like paradise. This second poem is called Maracas Beach Prayer. Um, and I wrote it on Maracas Beach in Trinidad. Maracas Beach Prayer. With sandy grit and salt and weeds, each large wave returns to beach Make my life the simple Lord. The waves consume you where you stand and feet float up from shallow sand. Make my life this simple Lord. I swim past their crash to gentle seas and tread still water with my feet. Make my life this simple Lord. Some men pull nets, their veins like streams and kids, they kick their ball and scream. Make my life this simple Lord. Of all the gifts you have to give, if this could be a way to live, make my life this simple, Lord. And, and this is a poem called A Portable Paradise. Um, I, I was lucky enough to have this put on the underground, which was a major shock to me because they didn't even tell me they was going to do it. And so I was just like, whoa, what a surprise. <laughs> People just started sending me like pictures of it. But I do like this poem, so I'm glad they put it out. Uh, and A Portable Paradise, what should I say about it? Oh, it explains itself. A Portable Paradise. And if I speak of paradise, then I'm speaking of my grandmother, who told me to carry it always on my person, concealed, so no one else would know but me. That way they can't steal it, she'd say. And if life puts you under pressure, trace its ridges in your pocket, smell its piney scent on your handkerchief, hum its anthem under your breath. And if your stresses are sustained and daily, get yourself to an empty room, be it hotel, hostel, or hovel. Find a lamp 
and empty your paradise onto a desk. Your white sands, green hills and fresh fish. Shine the lamp on it like the fresh hope of morning and keep staring at it till you sleep. Um, I have always been interested in the music of poems, how other poets listen. I feel that their listening helps me to open my listening. It's like they, they are doing it allows me to be able to do it. I like that the music of a poem is reflecting or rejecting the poem's content. And if it is doing something quite different from the content, what is it doing? Is it creating a tension with the narrative in the poem or is it so removed that it's becoming the narrative itself is, is leading the narrative itself, meaning the words are subservient to the music. Um, some poets I often turn to when I'm trying to tone up the music of my poems are uh, Shane McCree. He had a really good book called Mule that kind of messed with syntax in a major way. W.H. Auden, that's supermetricality. Gertrude Stein's Tender Buttons, where nearly her syntax nearly destroyed the meaning at times, but kept me there. Or Terence Hayes, an American sonnet for my once and future assassin, or Harriet Mullins, Sleeping with the Alphabet. But the writer I consistently come back to is a writer called Carl Phillips and his collected poems called A Quiver of Arrows. I want to read you a Carl Phillips poem called The Entire World, The Entire Known World So Far, so you kind of have an understanding of how he uses syntax and how he uses these long run on lines to kind of create a kind of compulsive reading. The Entire Known World So Far by Carl Phillips. What's meant to be wind emerges from what presumably a God's mouth. As if people thought that way once, as I have read they did, though I have never believed it. Yes, the stag inexplicably there on a raft at sea, how the light catches in the runnel fur of the dog's underpaws as he stares across stream. Yes, the gods and their signs, if you want, everywhere. But the wind is the wind. The map makes the world seem like a human body when it's been stripped and you can finally see it for the world. Plunderable, almost in places, as if asking for it. Who wouldn't want to lay waste to it? The map suggests, suggests the hands that made the map with the kind of grace that proves grace can be a sturdiness too. But the world is not like a human body or the dark that just past twilight overtakes a canyon, or the shiver of sleigh bells on the collar of an invisible donkey scratching itself in the dark, in the cold of it. Donkey bells. Yeah, really nice, you know, kind of arrangement, suspended sentences. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of Carl Phillips. Here's some notes that I, I, I wrote when reading, when writing the book. And these are just random notes. Um, but I hope it's helpful. Mm -hmm. Am I a poet or a reader? The designer Virgil Abloh talks about wanting to create work that can appeal to the tourist and the purist. Hmm, interesting. Can I make my work entirely about process? Is that the only thing I can control? How can I be more process-based? How can I make process more rigorous and more interesting? I can't control anything about its reception. So it makes no sense pouring psychic energy into anything else except the process. So let me just get a sip. Uh, Kai, making sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool, cool. I'll just check it. <laughs> um, the other thing, I'm going to read a couple more poems. And what I want to talk about for the, um, the book is the really touchstone of Toni Morrison and the massive influence of Toni Morrison on some of the poems. Um, OK, so this poem is called The Missing. And it was written for the victims of the Grenfell Tower fire disaster. I'll, I'll just read three, three more poems, yeah? As if their bodies became lighter. 
Ten of those seated on the front pews of the church began to float and then to lie down as if on a bed, then pass down the aisle as if on a conveyor belt of pure air. Slow as a funeral cortege past the congregants, some sinking to their knees in prayer, one woman rocking back and forth, muttering, what about me, Lord? Why not me? The risen, streaming slowly, so slowly, out the gothic doors of the church and up to the sky, finches darting deftly between them. Ten streets away, a husband tries to hold on to the feet of his floating wife, and at times her force lifts him slightly off the ground, his grip slipping, he falls to his knees with just her high heel shoes in his hands. He squints and shields his eyes as she is backlit by the sun. A hundred people start floating from the window of a tower block. From far enough away, they could be black smoke from spreading flames, a father with his child on top of his shoulders, men in sand-colored galabeers, a woman with an Elvis quiff and vintage glasses, a deep indigo hijab flapping in the wind, an artist in a wax cloth head wrap. Amongst the cirrus cloud, floating like hair, they began to look like a separate city. Someone looking on could mistake them for new arrivals to earth. They are the city of the missing, and we now are the city of the state. That's a standout image in the book. What's it? That's a standout image in the book. Oh, thank you, man. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, poetry. Let me see. Hold on a second. Portrait, the Portrait Museum. The morning after, the streets filled with portraits of missing people. Brothers with bushy beards, olive skin, wrinkled face, grandmothers, pigtailed daughters with red ribbons smiling, stuck on tree trunks, walls, and fence boards, the neon red missing floating above their heads. In a minute of pure clairvoyance, we understand that many of these pictures are the faces of the dead. Some looking like they were saying the word goodbye as the picture was shot at a family gathering. Without sleep, some struggled to keep their posters straight, stop the sellotape sticking to itself. These were the flimsy paper faces of hope for the living. Those not taped well are blown away on the breeze. Many with posters refused this first day of mourning. As these went on, the wind blew most of them away. And the final poem of this section is called Ghosts. Um, again, for the victims of the Grenfell Tower fire disaster. Ghost. You feel it as soon as you settle in your new flat. Perhaps you are making rocket salad with lemon dressing. The smell of El Ras Hanout and cumin will assail your nose, make you think for a minute. You turn on a light and your hand will carry the faint scent of cocoa butter. You'll come home from the office and a young woman in a rust colored hijab, barefoot in mint pajamas, who you've never met before, will agitatedly ask you the way out. But by the time you point, she'll have disappeared. Interrupting your evening's Netflix selection, you hear the feet of at least six small children tramping overhead. The copper taps in your refurbished room smoke for a few seconds before flowing with water. Your weekend lover says he'd rather you stay over at his place and give you no reason. You find yourself making up reasons to stay late at the office or catch a drink with friends. At night, a roaring heat will break you into sweat. And no matter how you try, you can't wake up and you can't breathe. You'll hear a call to prayer mixed in with fellow Kuti's zombie and a five-year-old girl constantly screaming for help from the guttural part of her voice. And you'll sit in darkness for a while, clasping your knees, looking out your extra large window at the view you've paid so dearly for. 
Um, I've, I've long been a fan of novelist Toni Morrison. Uh, the way that she engaged in the history and memory and trauma and how historical memory was functioning to exclude African-Americans. I felt a similar way about British history and how it continually whitewashes the barbarity of slavery, imperialism, and colonialism. How British history presented Black British people as a floating historical presence. Also, that invisibility led to a devaluation of Black British life, creating a discombobulation, I believe, in the Black British psyche. Like there's something missing, something a little off balance in their feelings, but they don't know what. I also admire the Toni Morrison idea of how historical black trauma and loss can be held in a sight and be replayed for others. But also Toni Morrison's lyrical, magical and poetic force of her prose. I long for that type of force in my poems and try to develop my craft in a particular way in a portable paradise to try and get it to come across like that. She's one of these people who I have no shame seeing that she is an, is a massive influence. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they, there was a, a Turner Prize winner who was also quite influential too who called Lub Lubima Himid I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her name properly mm -hmm. Lubima, is, is that right? Lubima Hidden and in her, in her transformation of racist media narratives into paintings of aesthetic beauty for over four decades, she faced unimaginable blocks to continue with her art. I mean, I connect with her because there have been times where I've had my rent money and just the poems I wrote. But at every block, she found a way to overcome and persist. For me, she exemplifies what it means to pursue subjects of personal importance with her art develop her focus and thought in ways that allowed her to continue her practice when her environment, self-esteem, or circumstances were not at all conducive. She had to be alert and interested, have a mission, overcome setbacks, develop strong self-awareness, and not be stalled by theirs or others' negative thoughts. She had to learn to work through the lowest points and turn down the volume of society and self-doubt and get to that, that artistic work she needed to make in the world. Himid had to make commitments and follow through. She was someone doing everything and anything necessary to allow them to persist as an artist. Hmm. Interesting. Perhaps the things that you perceive to be holding you back can be kindling to your artistic poet and poetic fires. Perhaps you can transform oppression and black people into resonant poems of beauty, sad beauty, but beauty. That was one of the notes in my, in my book. Some of, the, some of the other notes was, your poems aren't finished until you present them to an audience. It's unfinished if it's stuck in a drawer somewhere. Yeah, when you part of your manifesto as well, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, that part of that was part of the manifesto. But yeah. so the manifesto had come from, from the notes in my book. Mm -hmm. When you don't know where to go with your poem, it feels uncomfortable. Sit in that discomfort long enough, and that poem will tell you what's next. The quality of poems you're consuming will have an effect on the quality of poems you're producing. What you put in is what you'll get out. I think I'll, I'll, we're probably not gonna get to four sections because of time, but I'll just end with this last section on um, imagery. Um, so I'm gonna read a couple of poems and talk about you know, the imagery, the kind of touchstones I had for imagery for the book. Um, oh, that's high point for the lookers. Let me see if my crazy analog, ah, crazy analog system of finding poems works. High bun for the lookers. High bun is high bun for those you don't know is a Japanese form, uh, and it ends with a haiku. And this is also for the victims of Grenfell. High bun for the lookers. The people. Hold on, let me just change the glasses. The people on the ground look up at the burning building, their faces illuminated by the glow of fire ash floating gently down. Pieces of burning building fall like giant sparks from a welder's torch. Then a flaming fire snake slides its way from the fourth floor straight to the top. In the lights of mobile phones, shadows make wave shift flags. 
until they no longer wave them and their silhouette fades to the roaring fiery light. The spectacle is now more like a painting of a building on fire than an actual fire. Black velvet night, rippling orange yellow and punch red acrylic flames. The lookers are imagining their settees in flames, their orange floral wallpaper slowly bubbling up and bursting like blisters before giving in to a blackened charred heat. Then the swan dive of a few bodies. Some sob for their own, some sob for others, some just sob. The soot in the air burns the no doses of the onlookers. Smoke makes some wheeze in the branch bronchiole of their lungs from when they were in the building, then not totally on fire, but from corridors of smoke when they edge blindly towards the stairwell, hoping to not walk into fire. The sky is darker now as a background to the flame, the smoke's rising like an offering of burning sage. The building has become a charred black tomb and the sky looks down on us saying, what is lost is lost. Gather what is left and build new lives. As for the onlookers whose numbers have swelled, this is what they'll remember. The floating ash, flaming debris, bodies in flight and bodies in shadow. The smoke leaving discreetly into the night sky, clouds at night and the snake, the giant snake of flaming fire. The heat at my back, I throw my baby out the window. Catch him, Lord. Uh, it's, I'll read this other poem. It's called Day Moon. So in on the Yorkshire, the Yorkshire Dales, there's a black men, black men's walking group, and they they walk together on the Yorkshire Dales. Um, I was recently in in Wales, in the country, and um, and then I read an article about you know black people being in nature, and how sometimes they're blocked. And there's really uh, good people called um, the Nook in Snowdonia are trying to encourage black people to take part in nature. Big up the Nook. Day Moon, for black men's walking group who walk the Yorkshire Dales. Beckons this spirit filled mist like some earthly firmament. This quilted sage and moss expanse can blank out a racist boss. Its trails will heal our trials and rage. We hear the cadence of our breaths and squelched percussion of our boots, walking beneath these branches bent into regal arches, talking till we soothe our two full minds. We walk for miles. Next week, we'll see the headers bloom. Like us, some may forget they thrive until watched by this full day moon, like ancient rocks lying where they please. We're couched by this soft earth and these dry weeds. I'll read this last poem called Grace. Um, my son had a, a very convoluted bird story and uh, we were helped out by a Jamaican senior nurse. And, um, and this, is a, this is a love letter to the NHS, to nurses, but also the West Indian nurses who have done so much for care in this country. Um, Grace. That year, we danced to the green bleeps on screens. My son had come early, just the one kilogram of him, all big head, bulging eyes and blue veins. On the ward, I met Grace, a Jamaican senior nurse who sang pop songs on her shift like they were hymns. Your son faced the, you see him just a pull off all the breeding mass then. People spoke of her in half tones down these carbolic halls. Even doctors gave way to her when it came to putting a line into my son's nylon thread of a vein. She'd warned junior doctors with trembling hands. May only letting you try twice. On her night shift, she'll pull my son's incubator into her room, no matter the tangled confusion of wires and machine. When the consultant told my wife and I on morning rounds that he's not sure my son will live, and if he lives, he might never leave the hospital. She pulled us quickly aside. 
him have no right to say that just raw so. Another consultant tells nurses to stop feeding a baby who will soon die. And she commands her loyal nurses to feed him. No baby must dead with a hungry belly. And she sits in the dark, rocking that well-fed baby held to her bosom, slowly humming the melody of Happy by Pharrell. And I think if by some chance I'm not here, and my sunlight should flicker, then Grace, she should be the one. Uh, let me just, just talk a little about, about imagery. But Roger, I think we might be running. Might quick. be running. Okay. So shall I just stop there? Yeah. yeah. I mean, okay. we have 60 minutes left now. Oh, <laughs> what? Okay, cool. Yeah, and we might not get as much of a conversation in, so... Okay, so let's get the conversation in. I, I, I obviously overshot what it is. So I want to have that conversation. So we cool. <laughs> yeah. rest some other time. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Let's, let, let's talk a bit, Roger. So let, let me just start with this. In any other year, winning the T.S. Eliot Prize would have catapulted you into this whirlwind of readings and travel right. and book signing. Right. Uh, but this year it catapulted you into a pandemic. Yes, yeah, yeah. And yeah. A lockdown and yeah. then the upsurge of Black Lives Matter, which in I think frighteningly perceptive ways your book predicts. Yeah, for sure. Let's just start with that. How have you been doing in all of this? What have you been doing? And how have you been making sense of this year? Well, you know what? I I'm incredibly lucky to be on lockdown with my family. And I'm incredibly lucky to be able to financial the to weather the kind of financial storm because a lot of my kind of um of my friends are are in a in a serious and bad way. So yeah. this, I just give thanks for that, you know. But I'm yeah. also incredibly lucky to win before this happened. <laughs> to win it before this happened. Because um I mean, I've seen some books come out in the actual journey, actual process of this, and yeah. they just they just sunk. You know, great books just sunk, and you know, part of my job is such. How can I try and give some shine to these great books that have been sunk because they're coming out in a time that everything is sinking? And I was incredibly lucky, and 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 just a twist of fate that a lot of the stuff that was happening, my book talked to it during the time of COVID, and I couldn't predict that. And I, I, I couldn't know that. And so even to some extent with some weird details, I have a, a, a haiku where you, there's you no... Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, it, the, the haiku beware. Let's talk about that. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. The beware, you know, like oh, kneeling on somebody's neck and killing them. It's a prophetic poem. It's, yeah. it, it, it's a poem beware, which itself is a warning. And I'll just read the haiku. It, yeah. When police place, place knees at your throat, you may not live to tell of choking. Wow. Yeah. Like it's when you read it, it's like, I'm like, oh, hold on. <laughs> when the whole George Floyd thing happened, that was the point I rushed to because I couldn't believe you had written this before that moment and that this yes. book got all this praise right before we were we were thrust into all of this. Yeah, and for sure, for sure. and your book was ready for us. Yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure. Um, you know what I'm really full of gratitude for? Some people have contacted me and said this book is helping them through this time. You know, oh, wow. and I'm I'm like, yo, that is what I want as a writer. You know, like, don't get me wrong, I like awards and I like people liking a book, but I'm very into like the usefulness of a book. You know what I'm saying? And like, and how a, how a book of poems could be useful because often lots of people don't think that poetry is a useful thing. You know, and so I'm I'm super I give super thanks for that, and I'm glad it's useful. Do I want it to be prescient? Do I want everything in the book to come out as predicted? I absolutely don't. You know right. what I'm saying? Because like, you, and I'm hoping a lot of other things in the book that I wrote that I know about don't come true. You know, so yeah. yeah. But I'm just, I'm just give thanks to be alive. I give thanks to be with my family. Give thanks to be able to do this. Like I'm full of gratitude. You know, it's like yeah. Oh, bless you. Yeah. What well, the the biography in your book describes you as living between uh, Trinidad and and the UK. Yeah. Uh, Tell me about that in betweenness. Tell me about yourself as because that's something I'm really interested in. Mm. Uh, 
-hmm. because I think you occupy these spaces naturally. Yeah. I, I I think of you as Trinidadian, but I think of you as Black British in a way like I wouldn't think of myself. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I, I think you occupy those worlds. So tell me yeah. about what does it mean to live between? What does it mean to be Trinidadian as opposed to Black British? How are yes. how do you make sense of these two identities? Well, you know, it's all it's always shifting and it's always changing. And as I grow older, things have shifted. I mean, I would even go to say like I probably no longer live between Trinidad and England. I think uh -huh. I, I think and now I live in England. And a lot of people don't know that I was actually born in England. So I, I was yeah, I was born in Hackney and I went to Trinidad when I was three. So I was actually raised in Trinidad. Right. Know? So I do have a particularly Trinidadian sensibility. But when when I was trying to have a child and I was married and I realized like, man, I live longer in England than in Trinidad. I had a sense of feeling black British and I had a yeah. sense of that I need to start casting my eye on where I live. And because I had a, a lot of, not in a negative way, that immigrant mind is like, okay, I'm here, but I live there. I'm here, but I live there. But yeah. after, you're talking after 30 years, it's probably 30 years now I'm living in England. I'm like, well, actually, I live here. This, this is where I live. And when I go back to Trinidad now, people see me one time. People are like, hey, English man, you want what well, you want? I could get anything from you. I was like, man, I'm from Trinidad. He said, you ain't from Trinidad lately. I was like, I, I am from Trinidad lately. They said, no, you're not. Because nobody in Trinidad walks that fast and nobody in Trinidad has shoes like that. So the yeah. things mark you out. And I go back to Trinidad and I say things from 30 years ago. You know, yeah. like, yo, yes, blood. Well, I'm sad. They'd be like, woo, I haven't heard that for a long time. <laughs> because what it is in Trinidad is a very oral culture and the, and the culture moves on every six months. But I'm coming back with language from 30 years ago that was in my formative years. And they're like, whoa, you know. Well, you know, I've always thought this about the diaspora, um, about the Caribbean diaspora, especially in Brixton, that there are things about the Caribbean that I can't, that if I'm looking for the archive of those things, I can only find it in Brixton. Of course. Of course. Because if you go back to the Caribbean, they've moved on. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But in Brixton, it's preserved. Yes. And they're still speaking in these ways that they spoke 20 years ago or 30 yeah, years yeah, ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and yeah. Brixton becomes a kind of interesting space in that. Yeah. In that but, um, I, but I also claim that space is not necessarily a bad thing. Like, I'm, I'm, right. I'm less... I'm, I'm less the culture in Trinidad is not as strong with me, but I just, you'll claim it as a diasporic thing. Because I think how culture kind of morphs in diaspora is very interesting too, but also valid, you know? Yeah, yeah. You, you just talked about something that I was thinking about while rereading your book, uh, about the importance of witness. Yes. Uh, which is something I keep on. It, it, it's, it's the most striking thing, I think, about this collection. Um, I mean, it, it even starts from the cover. I mean, that, yeah. that cover, I think, is, is a whole poem by itself. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's, Johnny, it's like a photographer called, I don't write, called Johnny Pitts, and he's an excellent writer, too. There's a book called Afropeans. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's wonderful. So we start thank from the cover with this portrait of Black men looking on, and we don't know what they're looking on to. And I think because it's rendered in black and white, it's this... It, it it both feels like a picture of the wind rush. Yeah, 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 yeah. You mean, and you see the kind of hints of modernity, the, the headphones right. over the, the little head, headphones. They have the little, little headphones there, yeah. And, but I think from the get-go, you, you position us as the onlooker. Yes. And, and that obviously is a major theme. From the very beginning, the people stood outside looking on to yes. Grenfell Tower falling, and and you become the onlooker, and the reader becomes the onlooker in several ways. But but tell me something about that. Uh, what does it mean to be a poet of witness? One of the in, in one poem, uh, walk with me. I think he identifies you as such, right? Oh. Uh, he says uh, uh, he calls me bookish, but before that, uh, he calls me witness. Right. And, and yeah, so I guess my question is, beyond the importance of, pay, of, of bearing witness, how do you craft that? How yeah. do you craft witness? Yeah. Because poets are so afraid of the present tense and what's happening. Yeah, sure. but that's what you're witnessing. And you're not just witnessing it, you're crafting it. How do you do that? 
Oh, you, uh, I, I can't really answer how to do that, to be honest with you, but I, I can tell you the concerns I had with it. So one of my concerns was to not let what I feel start to approach a kind of didacticism. I'm, yeah. I'm not preaching, you know? And yeah, yeah. Also, too, I'm trying to create empathy for the situation, and I'm trying to create probably honor for the situation. Honor less, because I didn't want to be, uh, you know, like, biased. But I'm trying to create empathy for the situation. And also, too, you know, a lot of people overlook uh, people like Linton Kwesi Johnson, man. He did some yeah. real interesting things about, um, of, like, uh, in, in Dreadbeat of Blood, that, that fire is, like, electric out of the red bulb. And yeah. you in it. you in it. And so a lot of that, I kind of was starting looking at um, uh, Linton's, how Linton really documented English people and um, how his poetry began to aspire to nearly documentary, how it held its own in relevance, and over time nearly aspired to documentary. I was like, okay, that's a good, that's a good format and a good way. Like if the poems could evolve to documentary and kind of um, a, a documentation of the time, you know. Um, yeah. Other than that, I tried not to, not to, to preach, and I tried to um, use imagery in a certain way to pull the reader into the moment. And so that they have a moment-to-moment -moment emotional response that's based on sensory perception as opposed to being told a story. Yeah. Well, one of the wonderful things is that you, you're constantly um, bestowing these moments with magic. And, and I guess what astounds me again is that you're doing it with something that I wouldn't touch. Yeah. Present tense, you are, sure. because you know, we. People, we often feel we don't have enough distance to do that for the present. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. um, And I think the the beauty of your collection is that you are witnessing the present tense, but you are approaching it as a poet, and you are, you know, you you give it magic. It's, it's oh, it's thank you, cool. thank you so much for that. I mean, to be honest, I didn't. To be honest, I didn't really think about it. You know, in terms of oh, I shouldn't play with this. I kind of like. I did a lot of drafts of poems. So mm -hmm. I, I did it in different tenses. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I just okay. like, okay, what to me, what's the most effective, what was the most effective of the versions that I, I made? So a lot of effective versions were in present tense. And um, um because uh, for this book, more than any other book, I was like, you know, test, don't guess. You okay. don't know what it is. You, you, your, your rules could be completely wrong for the actual material that you're trying to play with. And mm -hmm. so I, I was lucky to test a lot of these poems, one in readings, but two with other poets who I respect. And they'd be like, yo, this one, this one. Okay. So I, I had a lot less guessing and a lot less kind of like yeah. crowds looking at different versions of what it could be, you know, and, yeah. and kind of judging resonance. You know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thinking just a little bit more about the two islands, probably the three islands that you're moving between, Trinidad and Tobago as its own twin yeah. island. And and Britain as its own island. Sure. Uh, it seems to me, especially in this moment, you you have been pulled between these worlds that are both marked by racial tension. For sure, yeah. Different kinds of racial tension, but they are both profoundly marked by that. Right. Uh, how do you make sense? I mean, what are the differences between those tensions and how do you, yeah, how did you witness it in Trinidad and and witness it in the UK? Well, in Trinidad, it's like a lot of shadism and, and, and class in a way too. You know what I'm saying? And um, mm -hmm. uh, so in Trinidad, like you can't see, no, but my my hair is quite straight and curly. And I had dark skin, <laughs> curly, <laughs> dark skin curly hair boy privilege. You know, it's like, it's there were so many layers about your proximity to whiteness in Trinidad that allowed you access to different places besides besides money. I mean, my, my father worked as a, in, in, it was Texaco, and then it became Trintop. But when it was Texaco, it was an expatriate place. The, the oh. social club was everything. And he was the only black person in management. So every time we jump into the pool, somebody would come and say, hey, you're not supposed to be here. Just because we were black. Not yeah. <laughs> because everybody else was either white or very light skin, you know? Um, but my experience of that was so much, it's like when you're living in it and you're young, you you see it for what it is, but it's all you know in a weird way, you know. Yeah. Whereas in, in racism in England, I find there's the open racism that I've experienced, where you know, where police literally stopping you every two minutes because you're driving somebody's nice car. 
you know. Mm-hmm. And, but then there's the real subtle racism where I call, and it's not subtle, the real racism is what I call the closed loops, the structures that prevent you from doing stuff and you don't even know it's happening to you, you know. And yeah. so if it is there's something like the University of East Anglia is accepting less than 1% of writers who are black or of color, but yet 80% of the agents are going to University of East Anglia. That's a closed loop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you don't, you don't have access. And England is full of multiple closed loops. And yeah. from, from the Oxford and Cambridge all-boy networks to uh, different levels of class to different levels of um, uh, uh, ability to access money to progress. And so England is renowned for its closed loops. And that is what people have to look out for more than blatant racism, the things that you're not seeing that holding you back. Yeah. And how, how to make black people invisible, you know? Let, let me read you something I, I read in today's right. Trinidadian Express. Yes. Yeah. We don't have to talk about it, but I, I thought how pertinent to your book. Yeah. It's, it, it, it's a commentator, and he says, one of these not so good days, some fool will vent his or her racial spleen on the antisocial media or in some public space once too often in a rant that has gone too far. Another fool will feel sufficiently aggrieved to react with more than mere racial uh, epithets, yeah. possibly summoning idle but willing hands to take up cutlasses. And this is where it gets interesting. Sending his island back into a future filled with hatred, bile, sewage, and all negative things, a potential paradise will never be allowed to bloom. Uh, well, and I that think I, paradise that you that, that that you talk about that comes from your grandmother, I yeah. assume Trinidad, who who tells you how to guard it and how to take it here and how to, I, I guess, nurture it and take care of it. I mean, how. You know, that, that, that's really beautifully done throughout the book, these different ideas of paradise and the paradise that we're not allowed. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I mean, what I, what I would say is I'm from San Fernando in Trinidad. And in San Fernando, I went to Naprima Boys High School, which is a, a big Indian population. And I always lived peacefully with Indian people because that's what I, what I grew up with. But I think politics plays a big role in separation, especially when it comes to election. And that's traditionally you know, stoking up the fires of racism to try and get votes and make sure the votes go a specific way racially in terms of stuff. And I've seen a lot of stuff on Facebook from Trinidadian friends saying, like, we have to stop this. This is absolutely yeah. ridiculous. Um, so uh, I, w- I would say, I mean, I haven't lived for a long time in Trinidad for a long time, so I, I'm, no, I'm not able to commentate, but I know when I was growing up, it's just like, yo, I lived with lots of races completely happily, yeah. and all of them had a Trinidadian identity that was strong for me. What it was is when you decide to go to a club, you know, you decide to go to a club that only wants people lighter skin than, than red. Then you feel, you're like, whoa, okay. So, you know, or it's in the advertisements on TV. You're just like, oh, okay, you don't see no black people on the advertisements. But that's when I was there. I can't say no. My sister's there yeah. now. I'll have to ask her. Yeah, well, I mean, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, I think I think what you what you're doing is, is is what should be done. I mean, you. I mean, hopefully there are writers in the cargo, and I know there are who are bearing witness to it. You are bearing witness to it here. Um, you know, thank you for giving us your time, Roger. We are pretty oh, much out of time. Oh man, I was just gonna gonna get to Kai so much. Thank you so much. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. By the but, way, by the way, Kai made me stop writing about my big head in Bocas one year, where he's just like, yeah. Literary eye is sort of dead, you know? So, so he was a big influence on this book in terms of some of this stuff. Yeah. Well, thank you, Roger. Um, yeah. You know, uh, the, what I would say is, you know, the, your win of the TSL, it was so important. It was something I was looking forward to. And I think the, impo- the, the amazing thing that happened, and I'm not sure many people have framed it like this, about both your win and Bernadine Everista's yeah. win of the book prize, isn't, it wasn't just that black writers won, but it was that black writers who identified as black British sure. and who were writing about the black British experience and bearing witness to it. Right. And that had never happened before. Yes. And it, it, was, it was an incredible moment. Uh, I thank you, Roger. Thank you so much um, for framing it up like that for me. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us here at the Edinburgh International book festival uh, for this conversation with Roger Robinson. This event was sponsored by the British Council and 
by the generous support of donors like yourself. If you've enjoyed watching this free event, please uh, feel free to make a, don a donation to the Edinburgh International Book Festival. Uh, Roger's books and all other books featured by writers at the festival are available online at the independent bookstore shop.edbookfest.co.uk. Um, thank you all for joining us.